come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a movie talk show podcast comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination we want you to help us with that and all you got to do is hit that like or subscribe button wherever you found us all that stuff helps us get found by other people who like the same they have the same discerning taste in uh weird movies as you do are we discerning aren't we i heard that we were uh the uh, some of the greatest curators of film on the internet radios Damn. I'm going to put that on my resume. Yeah, that was in the comments like last week. Oh, we're going to have to dig up who said that to us, but thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> it stuck with me. That's high praise. All right. Well, uh, you're probably out there in Radio Land wondering who you're listening to. These are the internet radio superstars Holly, Michaela, Sean. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by Holly. Holly, what did we watch tonight? Tonight we watched John Carpenter's Body Bags. From the year. 1993. Ooh, directed by John Carpenter, of course. John Carpenter, Toby and Hooper, and Larry Fulkes. Wait, wait, who? <laughs> uh, the the <laughs> first two I knew about. I knew those yeah, first who's the last two. one? <laughs> Larry, what? what? Who's, the, who's the last one? Fulkes? Yeah, who's he? Yeah, who's that guy? That's a good question. All right, I'll tell you. He's the guy who directed the morgue scenes uncredited. Uh, The morgue scenes were directed by somebody other than John Carpenter because they star John Carpenter. Uh, Okay. Bravo. Bravo. So. uh, Whose idea was this? (laughs) Yeah. Well, we've. um, I mean, obviously, you know, it's like on on a show like ours, John Carpenter is going to come up often, right? Yeah. That's Um, a count. Oh man, I don't even uh what we've done uh we did we've the, done like 3 in the past year alone, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot. They all came at like a in a cluster, but we've done the fog, we've done Vill- uh, no, did we didn't do Village of the Dam. We did uh, Yeah, no, we, yeah, did. we did. We did. Okay, yeah. Village, Village of the Damned in the Mouth of Madness, They Live, Christine, uh Escape from LA and John Carpenter's Body Bags. So we're kind of skirting her. Our- that doesn't count. It counts. He didn't direct it. He wrote and he directed <laughs> some of that movie. Well, then he re- he was counts. a producer on Halloween three, which we also did. Okay, <laughs> John Cart. Also Carpenter. covered Halloween twenty eighteen. He's got a characters by credit on that. <laughs> he did the score. He did the score. That's like ten for Carpenter. That's right. You can't get away from John Carpenter. Holly, what's the appeal of John Carpenter? What's the appeal? That's right. Yeah, like, Tough questions like right off the top. Here we physically, go. Physically, as a man, what's the appeal? <laughs> Especially in this movie. I think the question is, what's not to love about John? Yeah. I was like, how am I supposed to answer that? That's the man question. can do it all. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning? The man's a legend. He's a renaissance man. He can write, produce. He can act. He can act, Colin. Yeah. He's got he a can, pretty much starring role in this movie. He can do the whole movie top to bottom, music and all. Come on. That's right. He was, he's Robert Rodriguez before there was a Robert Rodriguez. Indie, uh, indie guy, John Carpenter. You know what I've always thought about John Carpenter? Because this is the, the, the awesome thing about, you know, uh, as the Saturday Night Freak Show goes on, we learn more and more as time goes on. John Colin. Carpenter. All right. This may be a bold statement. I don't know. But I've listened to the guy talk now at length. Right. He's a hero of mine. Met him in person. Um, I think that John Carpenter is a guy who is not really as big a horror fan as we think that he is. I think John Carpenter is a guy who, if the Western w- had not imploded as a genre, as he was like, you know, coming up into his career, he would have wanted to be making Westerns. Oh, yeah. He like basically mm-hmm. says that all the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but this is what's changed and we've since talked the last about time. that on the show. <laughs> but I went and watched because he wrote two westerns. <laughs> okay, he didn't direct John them. Carpenter's Vampires. <laughs> well, I, and I watched that one again too, with that in mind, going like, this guy okay. wants to be Sergio Leone, so let's you know look in, and yeah, vampires. 
Um, but he wrote a movie called Blood River for John Wayne in the early 1970s because John Carpenter originally got started. Uh, he sold a lot of scripts, including Eyes of Laura Mars and uh, uh, the Philadelphia Experiment and you know all these other things as he was you know becoming an up and coming uh, filmmaker. He wrote a movie for John Wayne. This would have been in like the Rio Lobo period of John Wayne's career. And apparently John Wayne, you know, had looked at the script and passed on it. It was later made as a movie for CBS TV that starred Wilford Brimley in the John Wayne part and Ricky Schroeder. And I watched wow. it and <laughs> it was not good. So I was going to say, that's, that's quite a trade off. Yeah. I wrote this for John Wayne. Let's put it in the Brimley pile. <laughs> yeah, this is, but at least it got made, I guess, by, you know, somebody. I'm not sure if that was a Tommy Lee Wallace movie. Um, and he also wrote one called um, El Diablo, which I think was later done as a cable, like a Showtime or HBO movie. And I think they had Le uh, uh, Louis Gossett Jr. and maybe Anthony Edwards. I'm not entirely sure. I haven't seen it. But. What I what I gathered out of this was that basically this is this is true for all you up and coming uh, movie uh, director wannabes, right? Who who want to go into this? The genre that you love is maybe not the genre that you're really good at. Colin, <laughs> yep, yeah, well, I, 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 I just Colin. what I'm saying. You learn as you, you should be making love stories, Colin. Yeah, I, I see. This is a, I'm the opposite of John Carpenter. I like horror movies. I should make westerns. He likes westerns. He should be making horror movies. Yeah. Um, Holly, do you know how this movie came about? Uh, this was supposed to be a uh, a pilot for a Showtime series that was going to mimic Tales from the Crypt. Because so Tales it was going to be from the Showtime's Crypt. version of Tales from the Crypt. Yeah, Tales from but the Crypt it was obviously such a... never. It didn't take off. It was it was it was shut down after they filmed this. Yeah, after the Showtime brass watched this uh, movie, they're like, Meh, we don't need to continue with our investment, but we have this John Carpenter movie, and so we'll put it out. Yeah. Um, Tales from the Crypt, as we established on our Tales from the Crypt Demon Knight episode, was a huge, uh, and we did the movie Tales from the Crypt, but obviously mm -hmm. it was a huge, uh, the, the 90s, late 80s, 90s, HBO incarnation was a huge deal, and the Crypt Keeper was the biggest horror star since Freddy Krueger. Um, and so, of course, everybody wanted to get in on this stuff. The anthology mm -hmm. movie, or the anthology story came back. What do you do? You guys, I mean, do you like anthology horror movies? Love I them. do. I love, love them. them. Yeah. What do you? Depends. What's some are really good. What's the appeal of the anthology movie? Well, More bang Colin, for your buck. Colin, if you're someone that likes to smoke a lot of weed, it is. It goes great with being high. Uh, are you saying attention spans? Attention span. yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I can't remember what happened ninety minutes ago, but I can remember what happened twenty minutes ago. This is perfect. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so that's it's it. It's just basically. enough time for you to get super invested and then get, see a, hopefully a satisfying <laughs> ending and then get hyped again for the next ride. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? And you're it's, just like, oh, shit. And then you're finished with one. And you're like, oh, shit. Am I watching a movie? Sweet. Let's get back into this. <laughs> and you kind of go from one to the other. That was always the criticism of the anthology movie was always that, you know, uh, that you would have to be introduced to new characters. You'd spend some time with them and then it would stop. And then you'd have to build back up again with a uh, completely new cast of characters and setting. And that would stop. And so there was kind of that, you know, but maybe now, you know, because everybody does like binge watch television shows, you're kind of more used to that rhythm. I mean, I, I don't know. I honestly, I never really thought about anthologies all that much until we started watching more on the show. And I realized how much I really do like them. And then was it, last year the year before that we got the ballad of buster scruggs on netflix oh, that was i so good. i was like i i don't know why people don't do this more like it's just such a great platform for really good ideas that you don't have enough to make it a full feature but you know it's a good idea like you get so much entertainment out of it you know you don't you don't have as many slow spots in the middle you, it doesn't have as much drag time to fill the 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 time slot you know you can get out these great ideas without being bored. I really hate watching a movie that 
is longer than it needs to be. And yes, then they don't exactly. have a story that warrants the runtime, so they pad it out. Like that, I hate that. I'd much rather just watch a short film if that's what's best for the script. For sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And what's great about it is that with anthologies, you get the opportunity to bring different talents together into one film. Which yeah. I think is like it's great for and it's great for a lot of genres, but you know, horror movies, because we have these these icons who make horror films to bring them all together. That's like yeah. ringing the dinner like, bell for the horror community. Yeah, and I feel like you get artistic freedom to experiment more with an anthology, right? Yeah. Like you might not take as many risks with a full feature, but with with shorts like that, you might take more risks. I think it's easy too to get some bigger names to commit to just yes, you have to come in for a few days instead of a few weeks or a few months. You know, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just recently rediscovered the uh, Tales from the uh, the Tales from the Dark Side movie. I watched that again, and I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I haven't seen Tales from the Dark Side, but also there's a. I think there's a downside anthologies as well, like Cat's Eye. Like, <laughs> wait, what's the? But what's the downside though? It being Cat's Eye, that's just <laughs> not. not <laughs> Um, I mean, I mean, they're not all winners, you know, like yeah, we've definitely watched anthologies. We've definitely watched anthologies where I'm like, OK, that middle story, not so great. And it did slow down, you know, yeah. uh, this might be blasphemy, but I just rewatched the Twilight Zone movie from 1983. And I love that movie. I have a lot of good childhood memories watching it. But wow, some of the segments that I didn't remember as much from my childhood do not hold up very well and are pretty boring, actually. <laughs> yeah. So that's the problem with an anthology movie is usually like, how do you, you know, say, is this movie good or not? Because it's either as good as its best segment or it's as bad as its worst segment. I'm assuming, Sean, you're saying cat's eye. There were more losers than winners in that. (laughs) So you're like, so (laughs) so you're like, I don't, I don't really care for it. Right. Is it worth going back to this to watch that one story that I like? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, That that can be a downside. I mean, but like a rewatch when you're just watching it by yourself, like if there's one, you know, you don't like, it's easy to just fast forward, you know, it's easy just to skip to the next one. But I mean, you do, but sometimes you do have to like in our, in our case, when we're reviewing the, the thing it's in, in its entirety, you do have to take into account are are the other ones good enough to sit through this one? You know, I got a question for you. Here's a question for the group. Then anthology movie. What's the perfect number of segments? Four. I think three. I, I like three, but, but maybe three. I mean, four, I think is what we usually get. Three might be. Three might be pretty good. I think about how long the crate goes on for in Creepshow and how that really slows down the rhythm of that movie as a whole. And I think that Creepshow would have been better served as three. I think so, too. And Creepshow was a five. There were five in Creepshow. I think there's five in some of the the amicus amicus films obviously did. Like, that was their thing, was anthology movies all through the the, the 70s. How many were there? How many were there in Black Sabbath? Three. Three. Was there three? Yep. Okay. How many were in Trick or Treat? Um, eh, what is there? The it's three or four? I, is, trick or Treat's a little bit different though, because they all come together in one kind of narrative. Is Pulp Fiction an anthology? No, I've never thought of it as one. No, that's all. No, that's not an anthology. Why not? <sighs> Just. Uh, I know you're playing devil's advocate, but you know why. Kyle. No, I actually do think it's an anthology. Do you think it's an anthology? Yeah, because Go was another one that, you know, because I guess the thing that Tarantino did was he said, what if we have an anthology, but characters will cross between the stories and uh, the first and last um, story feature basically the same characters, mm. right? So it's like, uh, is it still an anthology if the same people are in it? You know, yeah, I think that's and- what makes it. That's what makes it not an anthology. I feel like if it's tied together by anything besides the narrator, it's just not. That's exactly why I don't think Trick or Treat is an anthology. Yeah, the same as in all of those stories, and all those characters cross paths with each other. Yeah, but I would say it's still an anthology. It's just they've I, come I, up with yeah. a way to, in order to make it feel like a 
they're trying to get away. I guess the 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 structural thing that they're doing there is trying to bridge what I said was the criticism of the anthology movie that it's they're also separate. They're bleeding them together by having you know characters cross between them. So it's like, oh, it feels like it's a full movie. It's just we're following these people for a while and following them. But, I mean, they do have usually set beginnings and ends of when, you know, it's like, okay, now we're into this story, you know. Um, okay, well, I was just throwing that out there. I was curious, like, what's the perfect? Because usually the thirty, the three-story anthology is the 90-minute. They're half hour each. Uh, right. Some of them will do that. You know, you have the centerpiece story, which is a little longer than a half hour or whatever, that's the 20 minute one. The rest of them are 15s or whatever. But, um, okay. So John Carpenter's body bags comes at us. Um, I think it was after in his filmography, uh, memoirs of an invisible man. And prior to in the mouth of madness. Right. And then that was followed by village of the damned, um, vampires, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so, yeah, this is, um, I don't know about this period of John Carpenter's career. Uh, I guess I've always been a fan of his earlier stuff. And in the 90s was kind of when it was like, I mean, I guess, you know, I think we we covered uh, In the Mouth of Madness. That's maybe the last good John Carpenter movie. I don't know. I mean, even that one's not like a one that you can recommend to normies, you know? It's like, yeah, John Carpenter, watch In the Mouth of Madness. I mean, that's for horror movie people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so this is a, and his creative team is completely different, but man, that guy's loyal. He uses the same editor, same photographer, you know, the same producers, same casts in, you know, in, in all the movies that he makes in this period. Um, so this uh, is a, is a movie that has three stories. Um, two of them are directed by John Carpenter and one of them is directed by Toby Hooper. So, um, first of all, I guess, Holly, why don't you tell us about, uh, what was your impression of, uh, the, uh, the crypt keeper like character in, uh, body bags. Right. So we have, uh, we have our host who is in the morgue. Um, and that is none other than John Carpenter himself in full ghoulish makeup. And I normally, I, I think Michaela and I have agreed on this. We usually hate a director cameo and it's usually pretty offensive and pretty like in your face and stupid, but I actually, I actually dug it in this. I think he does a pretty good job because he's supposed to be, you know, kind of outrageous and uh, Sean, you compared him to Beetlejuice and I think he that's feels a pretty, like that's a pretty good comparison. He's kind of Beetlejuicy. <laughs> yeah. He feels Beetlejuicy. Yeah, I like I Beetlejuice, but I actually, I actually dug it. He's like Beetlejuice Crypt Keeper. I was, I was into it. I was surprised by how engaging and charming I found him to be on. Camp, yeah, honestly, I'm he's kind of yeah, affable. And he, the thing that I guess surprised me about it is how at ease he felt, uh, you know, in his performance. Because I think yeah. uh, Carpenter has always said that, you know, I mean, because he he is not at ease in the fog. Right where he plays Bennett, the uh, uh, whatever he helps, uh, he's like the church right. deacon, he's like or the assistant, like that. yeah, yeah. Um, so he's he comes off very stiff in that. So this is like, you know, I mean, again, we're you know, whatever 20 years removed from the fog, and he's a little looser, but I mean, he really seemed to be getting into it, even though it's like, well, what do you do for a horror host? I guess in 1993. You're the Crypt Keeper. I mean, like, they can't think of... It's either you're the Crypt Keeper or you're Rod Serling, right? Those are the yeah. two uh, things. So he's basically... Yeah, it's all bad puns. You know, your I, mileage I know, may it vary. Fe- it felt like he was having fun with it, you know? Right. And to see and to see John Carpenter having fun is fun. Because yeah, it seems like it exactly. takes a lot to engage that man to, for him to have fun doing something <laughs> for what, sight. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so what we know about sure. John Carpenter, he's just like, send me the check. I don't care. So to see him having fun is like really great. Yeah. yeah. So he didn't write this movie. I, uh, I'm not entirely sure that the two guys who actually are credited with the uh, script, but so this was some kind of assignment thing, but you know, again, he brought his whole production crew on board to do it. 
Um, the first story is called, and I guess this is like I said, when we do anthology movies, we got to take it kind of through the segments. So there's three segments. So we'll, we'll tell you about, uh, the three that we're going to go through here. The first one is called what? Holly. Gas station. All right. And set us up. What's the story of the gas station? So the gas station, we have a young woman who's working the night shift at a gas station and she, it's her first night. She's uh, she's a college student, so you know clearly this is just a, a crap job to get her through school, and um, probably and we see her doing her homework, so it's probably like okay, a night job. I I did this when I was in school. I had a job that I was working at night so that I could do my homework while I was at work, and um, so she's in one of those like little gas station booths where you don't really leave; you just kind of like do your payments through the window, um, but it's not like a full service. You could just get your your cigarettes and stuff. So this is her story of her first night at work at this nighttime gas station. Credit cards that you have to use the fucking swipe machine. Oh, yeah. Hey, I remember those days. What a pain in the ass. <laughs> Cigarettes oh, that we? cost, what was it, $2.36 or something like that? or something like that? Yeah. Oh. yeah. There were several times when I was working at Barnes Noble that the power went out and I had to run credit cards like that for people. And I oh, yeah. to call someone. It was awful. It took forever. Mm-hmm. When I yeah, when I worked at the credit union, we still had to use those for doing cash advances. I don't know why, because we still ran it through a machine, but we had to do an imprint too, and those things sucked. <laughs> <laughs> things kids today will never have to deal with. They don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, no, you had to put the no like, carbon no, paper on top of the credit card, and then this like uh, whatever <laughs> huge iron bar you slid across the thing, and it would make a you yeah. could lose a finger in that thing. Yeah. Those things are powerful. <laughs> made a copy of the credit card number on the mimeograph sheet. Um, all right. So this uh, episode um, was directed by Carpenter. It has. Uh, let's talk about the cast. Who do we have? Oh, in the, oh wait, 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 wait. But the setup. She's working the night at the the, the thing. But on the TV, we see that uh, over in Haddonfield. Right. The shout out to, of course, if you're going to steal some from somebody, I guess you steal from yourself. Of course. Um, over in Haddonfield, a woman's body has been found in a dumpster, and apparently there is a serial killer on the loose. She is a psychology student. Did you notice? She's studying yeah. psychopaths because it got to be right on the nose. This is a short film. <laughs> just, you know. It's a good universe, Colin. It's yeah. So is this, I was going to say, is this yeah. canon? Are there more murders in Haddonfield now? Well, that's the thing, Sean. I'm glad you brought that up because I looked up the timeline. So. Based on when this movie comes out, if we assume it's happening in 1993, it takes place between five and six. So these are murders that we have not seen on screen in any Halloween movie. Because they're not committed by Michael Myers. Well, that's what I'm saying. We don't know for a fact. That, that's what I'm saying. But here's your chance to write a fan film about what happens between these movies and this lady being found in a dumpster. Go Great idea. I don't, I, I don't want fan films. I want a real film. Someone needs to get into this. <laughs> well, that's how you get it made, though, Sean. Write the fan film and sell it. Yeah. The, the term fan film just makes me want to throw up. But uh, hey, continue. Hey. <clears throat> well, Fifty Shades of Grey is Twilight fan fiction, and that person is a freaking billionaire. Well, a not legit billionaire. billionaire. I like, think she might be close to a billionaire. She's close now. to a billionaire. Yeah, uh, she wrote fan a whole fiction. book. I don't have that Go time. <laughs> no, it started as a like forum, like a website forum fan fiction. That's how yeah. it started. It was not <laughs> what what fat life. What is this? Something like that. Yeah, it was yeah, like Twilight don't underestimate fan fiction. Fan fiction. <laughs> well, S and M sex, but in, in, here nor there. I mean, All you right, know, so the, okay, so the the cast in this movie. Who do we have? Oh gosh, in in the gas station we have um, who do we have in the gas station? Uh, well, we have. Robert Carradine is in the gas station. Who we, we would have, know from, uh, of course, his big role in Revenge of the Nerds. Robert Carradine, that's right, an unlikely uh, John Carpenter. <laughs> we just talked about recently how many Carradines there are. You can't expect me to know who any of them are or what they're. Yeah, are. I've forgotten. Many. Yeah, many. he was uh, <laughs> Revenge of the Nerds was his big thing. I don't think like that he did anything as big as that. That's the movie that's going to be stenciled on his tombstone. But he was also in, uh, briefly, a cameo appearance in Escape from L.A. So there you go. Now we've put two toward Robert Carradine on the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Uh, who else is in it? Um, we also have uh, Alex Datcher, Peter Jason, 
Uh, um, well, Peter Buck Jason, in this one. Peter Jason and Buck Flower then are our mm-hmm. Carpenter regulars, right? Alex mm-hmm. Dasher, she was if she looked familiar, it's because you saw her in Passenger Fifty Seven with Wesley Snipes. Right now, I remember. I was going to say she looks familiar, and you know me, I love a good Passenger Fifty Seven. <laughs> and we have we have uh, guest appearances by Sam Raimi and Wes Craven. John Carpenter directs Wes Craven. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? I knew it too. <laughs> I haven't, I, I realized I have not, I think I've maybe seen the interstitials with John Carpenter a little bit, but I haven't seen this movie. Me neither. This is my I favorite. knew that was, as soon as someone passed behind her and then went, I'm like, that's Wes Craven. I can tell by that fucking outline. <laughs> <laughs> David just, Naughton, you could tell coming a mile away too. I was yeah. like, yeah, that shape of that head and that hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, American yeah. Werewolf in London's David Naughton, <laughs> star of Hot Dog the movie. Okay, um, that's been coming up a lot lately. <laughs> hot dog all over the internet. <laughs> really? I what just, the- recently? Like people have been watching Hot Dog. I don't know. I think it was at a drive-in. Somebody went to a drive-in and we're watching Hot Dog and maybe they do hamburger, hamburger the motion the picture. Movie? Yeah. motion picture, hamburger the motion picture. <laughs> hot dog. The double feature. Yeah, Hot yeah. Dog the movie, hamburger the motion picture. Um, okay, so. Uh, I don't think we're missing anybody, right? That's basically the cast. I think that's it, yeah. So, um, I mean, it's so this is a suspense thriller, right? This one, yes, It's basically she's alone in the um, gas station, and these creepy guys keep coming to the window. Wes Craven is a hobo at the beginning, or so he's drunk, right? Yeah, um, he's a lecherous old man. Then we get George Buck Flower, who's the hobo. Uh, when David Naughton shows up, she's kind of like, oh, a normal, normal guy. And she's <laughs> kind of attracted to him. He's like another student or something like that and invites her out. Um, but we're always kind of looking at all the people that she meets as like, which one of one these of people killer. is the killer? Yeah. You know, and you, in my I'm, in my mind, you know, I always go to, well, it's going to be the nice guy, right? Because you're suspecting all these creepy guys. So the nice guy that's just like, hey, you know, here's my credit card. You know, you go to school, like just the nice, polite, not too right. forward guy. Like, oh, he's going to be the killer. Yeah, the you David Naughton character. So it, looking at it that way and looking at his performance, was he playing it as I might be the killer? Uh I mean, if you're looking at it in the, if well, if you're going with that theory that like it's the nice guy that it's going to be, then he played it perfectly. How did he do it? What was the what, what? How did he? Yeah, what? He was not, he wasn't threatening at all. Wasn't threatening. He's a little forward, because but not he's interested. Yeah, he's showing interest, but not forward. Yeah, no, because he wasn't right. asking her out. He was like, "Well, there's. Do you go out?" And she's like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Yeah." Well, there's this bar. That's really cool. And if you go there, you know, maybe I'll see you sometime. I was like, that's a good way yeah. to ask somebody out. Yeah. It's like non-threatening, yes. and non, you know. Um, yeah. And then you just show up at the bar every day for the next time. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but he he has a st- an unblinking stare. And I'm like, is that an actor choice? Like when he talked to her and he's all smiley, but he just kind of locks eyes and doesn't, you know, I'm like, is he playing that as... Well, I might be the killer, you know, because obviously we're sitting there going like, well, yeah, George Buck flower as the uh, homeless guy, which is, I mean, I guess he's got the market cornered on this ca- type of character. How much money do you think he made <laughs> for just these appearances? I'm curious. Yeah. That's the kind of like, that's the behind the scenes. I want to know, like, what's he pulling down as a bum? Probably oh, not that know. much. Sean, I always used to guess that Fred Willard was the secretly richest man in Hollywood because he's been in literally everything and gets royalties from literally everything. I think sure, that's George true. Buck Flower is like the secretly richest man in horror. <laughs> you know? Could be. That's not a bad way to go about like a career in Hollywood. Just like, I don't need big roles. Just put me in everything. This way, when it plays on TV, I'm going to be rich for years. I get residuals from like eight different things at any given time. Yeah, I, I, he's I getting that sweet that back to the future money. Right, I yeah. you could turn right? on the TV at any given time and see Fred Willard on something. Very true. Like twenty four like hours a day, Fred Willard is in something. So you're you. It's like that would be your thesis in PCU, like the Kane Hackman theory. Yeah, yeah, the <laughs> Fred Willard theory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the the movie it basically um, this time watching it, I don't know if you agree, but um, I mean it's a horror thriller, and it's like, well, how does this work? It basically it it, it works on. Um, Human anxiety 
uh, around other human beings, right? Because mm-hmm. she's always, it's, you know, we're focused on her and the way that she reacts to these different people. The drunk guy comes up and it's like, you know, in the end of the movie, we know he's just a drunk guy, but she's like, oh, I got to, you know, protect my stuff from the drunk guy. And the hobo comes up and like, oh, I got to protect. And then the uh, David Naughton and she's like, hey, you know, it's David Naughton, you know, and then Peter Jason, she's like, hey, can you go check on the hobo? So he becomes like the, you know, yeah, I'll go in there and there's a weirdo in there. huh? I'll go check it. So he's like a defensive kind of, uh, you know, running back. <laughs> I loved, his, I loved his reaction when she was like, can you go check on the weirdo in the bathroom? He's like, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's, so yeah. Down for it. he's passed out in the bathroom. I passed out around the toilet. I had to aim over his head in order. He was so obnoxious, but I thought his character was so funny. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um. Ted Raimi makes a brief cameo appearance, at least at the beginning of the movie, as uh, employee of the month. Ted or Sam something. Uh, Sam. Yeah, Sam. Ra- Sorry, Sam Raimi. That's right, the real Raimi. Uh, and uh, <laughs> his picture's broken, though. Is that a, a symbol of something? We didn't say who well, Robert Carradine the plays she, in yeah, the movie. Yeah, she knocked it off the desk. Oh, that's what happened. That's right. Who's Robert Carradine in the movie? What's that? Who did Robert? Ca- we we glossed over who Robert oh, Carradine he, plays. He's Bill. So he at the beginning of the movie, he's um he's he's the guy getting off of his shift and telling her like what she needs to remember for her shift. Yeah. So it creates a lot of suspense uh, by basically, you know, she goes out to check on something. She forgets the keys in the place. She has to get back into the, you know, get the spare set of keys. George bought flowers there. The, the, uh, there's also like a, a mechanics, you know, like a garage there also. And the uh, hydraulic lift starts working by itself. And, you know, it shot. The only thing I remember even watching it back in 1993 was that, uh, this episode feels the most John Carpenter of the three, uh, but it needed to be widescreen. You know, it's just weird seeing John Carpenter at 185 to 1 aspect ratio. Right. Feels like John Carpenter, but there's a lot of like handheld in mm-hmm. this first part, which was. Which was kind of surprising. It's different. Yeah. yeah it's cause different. His style is usually like that kind of lockdown camera, or the steady cam. It was kind of unusual to see like a lot of. Uh, I mean, there's some point of view stuff, but there's a lot of like uh, handheld. I'm like, does John Carpenter do handheld? This this looks odd for his uh, yeah his you know for a stylistic approach. But maybe that's you know we couldn't afford the steady cam, John. You're working for Showtime, you know. Yeah, maybe Showtime. We're not HBO, John. We're not even Cinemax. <laughs> they are not HBO. That yeah. is that is a true fucking statement. All <laughs> right, so here's a qu- trivia question for you. Let's see if you know this one. So, uh, um. Well, okay, so there was HBO. Do you know this one? HBO had a companion network, and that was Cinemax, right? Showtime had a companion network. What was the companion network to Showtime? The movie Stars? channels? It was the movie channel. <laughs> Where's the so movie wholesome. channel now? They just, like, fucking got rid of that. <laughs> didn't movie, wait, didn't the movie channel become, like, reels or something? I don't, I don't so. know. Something it, like, I don't know. Did they just eventually fold it in and we're like, we're just show. That's what their, their logo yeah, is now. Just, just show. Yeah, showtime. <laughs> they're still around, right? Showtime, yeah. Showtime, yeah, they're bringing Dexter yeah. back for a revival. Yeah, because... You know, the- the last time I paid attention to Showtime was when, was Dexter, when Dexter was on. on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they get a hit once a decade and they never let go of it. Well, they also yeah. did, I guess, which ties into this movie. They were the uh, the channel that distributed the Masters of Horror, which also basically brought all these guys back together. And I was thinking about that a lot as I was watching this. I'm like, well, John Carpenter doing something for TV that isn't well. I mean, obviously he did, uh, you know, Elvis the movie, and uh, he did uh, someone to watch over me. Or no, sorry, uh, someone's watching me in the seventies. But it was basically he did two TV movies for Mick Garris's Masters of Horror. We're gonna have to find out <laughs> if Body Bags is better than those, or they're better than Body Bags. Stay tuned to the end of this episode. <laughs> you guys seen these? <laughs> I don't think. I've no. seen any of them, tell you the truth. Uh-huh. Isn't he doing, like, cigarette burns or something? Yeah, cigarette burns in one, and uh, Pro-Life, I think, was his, yeah. the one he did in the second season. I've seen Pelts, the the meatloaf one that's really bad. That's the Dario Argento uh, mm-hmm. season two episode, yeah. 
Oh. It's not good. Um, I've seen none of these. Meatloaf cuts his own skin off and takes it off like a jacket. Isn't John Ew. Saxon in that That's one, fun. too? I think so. Yeah. So this is where you That's get into anthology movies. All right. So basically, it's determined that uh, it turns out Bill is the killer. Um, he's revealed after she finds the body of John uh, George Buck Flower in the garage, and it's Bill. And then and real and well, she also finds real Bill in the locker. That's well, is that that's uh, Sam Raimi? But he's em- Bill, employee of the month. Oh, he's Bill. She's wearing Bill. John's uh, lapel. Who the fuck is John? She's got a shirt on, and it says John. Oh, maybe they yeah. haven't got her. Uh, they haven't got her name. Yeah, it's back her yet. first day, right? <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, it, it's her first. I'm pretty sure it was just a nod to Mr. Carpenter. Mm-hmm. So um, then the movie becomes. He Carpenter begins to employ. I thought uh, um, he's again stealing from himself um, techniques that he used in Halloween. You know, out of focus uh, shots of like the killer sitting up in the background and coming to you know stuff that he did mm-hmm. in the mouth of madness of you know the killer smashing through a wall. But it becomes like a chase movie with the mm-hmm. the girl and the serial killer, right? Mm-hmm. And she knocks him down, but then his eye opens and he, you know, right. <clears throat> I do appreciate when she, because he does start like going after and attacking her. He's got a sledgehammer. He's knocking out that front window of the booth and everything, mm-hmm. which is pretty good. Um, I yeah. do appreciate when she uh, when she fights back and like nails him in the face. Yeah, like, he's not some superhuman dude. Like he goes down for a little bit and he keeps going down. He keeps yeah, getting back up, but he gets messed up in this movie. Yeah, I was gonna say like if they were if they want if they were going for like one in the se- in this anthology series that was realistic like they did a good job with this one because everything that happened i was like you know none of this feels like supernatural or anything this feels like real stuff like her whole like the beginning with with you know cre- creepy guy after creepy guy when she's working at night i was i was like i know that feeling i have yeah. worked nighttime jobs like i worked at a hotel where every guy that checks in hits on you like i know that feeling and i like felt that in my core so like this tell whole me about thing, it, yeah. Yeah, you, know, Sean. you know, I worked, Sean knows front, what I'm talking about. I worked that front hotel checkout. Yeah, yeah, That's right. you know. Let us not forget about Sean's like, raw for sexual magnetism. Checkout? Yeah, yeah. As a listener pointed out, the raw sexual magnetism of Sean. I know it's yeah. it's startling, it's radiating sometimes. through the screen. They actually, um, I actually have to black out my screen on Zoom <laughs> so nobody, so I don't disturb anybody. I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, we all have a connection. Comes, I know it comes across very <laughs> intensely. Yeah, l- listeners, like, I, like I hope this, you know like that this man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our listeners should know that we have to pause halfway through so we can all just take a breath and you know take yeah. in Sean's ma- uh, magnificence. That's right. We edit yeah. those parts out, but I mean, yeah. we can't right, do a whole yeah. show in one one day. Maybe yeah. the Patreon will get you the whole episode. <laughs> <laughs> So she does get the better of this guy and she ends up uh, crushing him under a uh, the hydraulic press, which is actually kind of <laughs> yeah, cool. Say she gets the drop on him, huh? Oh. Him, uh, <laughs> blood comes spraying out of him and boom. Uh, it, it, it's 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 waves. Yeah, it of gushes out. Red blood. It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty good. It gushes yeah. out, man. Not bad. She's saved uh, as he's attacking her by David Naughton, who... Chekhov's, uh, you know, missing credit card leaves his credit card at the gas station. She's like, "No, you forgot your card." Sure enough, he comes back at the end. And he's like, "I forgot my credit card." As he yeah, saves I liked life. it. It was a solid tie-in. All right, it is like everything happened pretty naturally too. Like you yeah. would run out after a guy who forgot his credit card, lock yourself out, and then be stuck outside with the creepy hobo. It's mm-hmm. like a classic. This is. It's kind of a classic. Um, just like campfire horror story. Yeah. Right. It is. It's basically it's the beginning of urban legend, but expanded. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like the hook. There was, you know, and there's a crazy guy escaped from the, you know, you put that on the right. radio and boom, away you go. All right. Our yep. second story is called Hair, also directed by John Carpenter. Who's our, <laughs> our cast in this? Holly, who do we have in here? Stacy Keach. Stacy Keach. That's the wonderful right. Stacy Keach. <laughs> this one cracks me up. <laughs> <laughs> Not I what you would this. expect from a horror yeah. anthology, a John Carpenter comedy. Um, right. All right, who yeah, else is in it? We got Stacy Keach, who was also with John Carpenter in Escape <laughs> from Sheena LA. Easton? Sheena Easton. That's right. Sheena Anybody Easton's remember? Instance. Was it the Morning Train? Uh, is that, Fear, is that Fear Eyes Only. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. She was a singer. Sheena Easton. I couldn't pick her out. Like I had, but when I looked at the credits, I'm like, that was Sheena Easton. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Um, Sheena well, Easton and yeah. Stacy Keach. Yeah. We've got. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Oh, uh, <laughs> so. Oh no. <laughs> um, <laughs> the whole house is wired now. Everything okay? She, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so shouldn't, shouldn't that, right, shouldn't Shh, that monitor Alexa. come down so you can see the front door now? Like, oh yeah, I got everything wired up. I can watch everything that's happening <laughs> all around my house. It's fantastic. Um, uh, so we have um, uh, Stacy Keach. Uh, we have David Warner, who and, was in uh, In the Mouth of Madness, and David Wait. Warner's hair. Oh, David His hair. feathered, beautiful hair. This looks a like cameo my from Kim. Debbie Harry. Yeah, we have yeah. Debbie Harry as the nurse. And um, a brief uh, cameo by Greg Nicotero. As a man with luxurious hair and a dog to match. That's right. <laughs> so what's the gist of this movie? Set us up for this one. Okay, so Mr. Keach is, uh, he's unfortunately suffering from uh, something that many men suffer from. He is, uh, he's suffering from a little hair loss and he's feeling insecure about it, which he should not feel insecure about. At all, it's a natural thing, and it happens to well over half of men as they grow Holly, older. Thank Stop you, Holly. To me and Colin, and just, <laughs> I'm not. Could you I'm just not. Talk normal? I know because he's got like he actually has a hairline. He's just got thinning hair. He doesn't have he receding hair, yeah. hairline. A whole right. different ball game, you know. Yeah, it is. Women don't care about <clears throat> bald. Women so. don't want care. Don't. I know. Women I listen to David care. Warner as the doctor, who's the hair replacement guy, saying that you know. Uh, balding guys are more trustworthy to women. True or false? Trust me. Less? Less? I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't understand. I mean, that's. I think that depends on the rest of your aesthetic because you can yeah. also easily be a skinhead. You know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's no, true. The, yeah. I mean, depends on the rest of your look. I think my my trust in you has never been based on your hair. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone at all? Never. There you go. Absolutely. Well. Also happen to like bald guys. But what do you think of guys with the luxurious mane of long stallion hair? Stallions. What do you think of stallions? <laughs> some can pull it off, you know. Not sure. everyone can, but some can. What do you think of Stacy Keach as a stallion? I, for one, <laughs> think he's right. Oh, I think like it looks great he's on him. Found the look. <laughs> but he needs a fan on him at all times. This is, is. A, this is a weird time in American history. I don't think that this is like a thing anymore. And Mick Garris obviously still thinks this is going on. Uh, that, <laughs> that guys with really long Fabio hair. That's what you're going for. Jason the, Momoa. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose. Really? That, right. He's still, he's yeah. got. Does he have Fabio hair? Fabio yeah. had a mane. It was like a horse's he mane. Had, yeah, he had long hair. Yeah. Jason Momoa, I mean, he can put it up in a pretty hefty bun. He's got a lot of hair. That's true. He's got like thicker hair, though. This is thin, luxurious hair that right, you know, yeah. blows in the wind. And Greg Nicotero had this at this point in time. That's why we see him as the object of envy as uh, <laughs> Stacey Keach is going down the street and <laughs> looking at all these people with right. their yeah. Yeah, Women fantastic with hair. Women hair, then the dude yeah. with long hair, yeah, I, and the I, dog with I think long what hair. Made, I think <laughs> what dog. made it so perfect was that the first one he sees is this beautiful woman with long blonde hair, and you think he's checking her out, and then you realize he's just checking her hair out, mm -hmm. and I think that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so he goes to a doctor. This is David Warner, who's offering... Uh, well, no, he first of all, he tries painting oh, his he head. Tries. Yeah, he tries uh, so much. He goes to a salon. He sees a guy. These people don't go to barbers, right? You got to go to a salon. You're in Beverly Hills or wherever they are. Stylist. Like. Stylist. Thank which, you very much. But he's stylist. We didn't even talk about his mane. My God. He's got, I, I was, hate that man for his hair. That was like Uncle Jesse hair, but like blonde. And he was ripped Beautiful. and wearing a leather vest. His that's whole LA in the night. <laughs> yeah, <that's> yeah. <laughs> it feels it. that felt genuine, glorious. Yeah, um, and they're all, of course, telling him like, "Well, we can, we can do this with your hair, and whatever." And they give him a new comb. Just, you know, just shape you know. it. Yeah, just shape it. Which actually, I thought was like, oh, okay. I mean, that's an interesting thing that he did there, but you know, um, yeah, I was like, he actually did a really good job. He kind of like floofed it up, like it looked nice. This is some volume. It's a brave role for an actor, right? Because I don't know where Stacy Keach was in his hair loss journey. I don't know if they thinned out his hair, in which case, brave actor, or if he actually did have thin hair 
in which case the focus on it is like okay you're you're self-aware of this is you know what's happening to you mm-hmm. we're gonna make a whole movie <laughs> about either it. either way his performance i thought was flawless it was so natural like i believed everything the entire time yeah, I, was I didn't on know board. I wanted Stacy Keach in this role, but I am very glad that I got it. I was on yeah. board. It's, it's hilarious. I didn't. I think I laughed more during this than any other part of the movie. It's yeah, just for sure. It's so funny because <laughs> it seems like having hair is like the most important thing in the entire world to him, yeah. and it, almost to the point where it seems like is he like the only bald person in this universe? Because like it seems <laughs> he feels seems like that it. way sometimes. Yeah, he feels like it. You're you're they, adopting his perspective, and his girlfriend is powerful. like actually like she. Well, she's actually going like you know no, I don't like you when you do this weird thing with your hair and you're just not being who you are. But she does as soon as he like does the whole you know I'm gonna paint my head and all. She's like. I'm leaving you. <laughs> I can't right. take this anymore. You're crazy. Although if, yeah, I mean, look at him. I would too. Just like, I'd be yeah. like, get it together, dude. Well, like, yeah, because she kept telling him, she's like, I like you. Like, I don't care about your hair. And then he paints his head. Like, I think at that point, she's just like, I can't handle this insecurity. Your weird obsession is just freaking me out and I can't deal with it. it had nothing to do with your hair. It's you being weird. Well, if you mm-hmm. go to see David Warner, and his nurse, Debbie Harry, they will take a picture of you and feed it into their VCR, which is the graphic scanner that they have in their oh office. God. And it will put your picture on a TV monitor and you can choose, you know, what style you'd like. And of course, he wants the stallion, the long head of hair. So they do this. Uh, they, they, treatment. they skipped past like three really interesting hairstyles. Oh, yeah. Really yeah, quick yeah. when they were going to that <laughs> last stallion hair. So I'm like, wait, wait, no, go back. I want to see what, what else he looks like. Because it's not. It's not like it's supposed to be some computer imaging, but Stacey Keach had to sit down and put each of these wigs on for yeah. this movie, which I think is great. I <laughs> love Stacey Keach and weird red yeah. hair wigs. I like the first one was the Republican. Uh, this is our great. conservative look. The Republican. It did look just like Mitt Romney's hair, though. It did. It <laughs> like, did. they weren't kidding. I love that, that that's what they went. It's like, the Republican. I'm just like, it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. It's perfect. <laughs> it's totally Republican. What was the second one called? Uh, oh, it was like, it was the military. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it had a name. But uh, so then, or maybe it was, yeah, favored by policemen and soldiers yes yeah, um yeah. before a sudden oh, i want something dynamic and sexy <laughs> this <laughs> massive head of hair so they give him this uh treatment and he bandages his head he wakes up the next day and sure enough like magic he has a luxurious mane of hair when that, f- when that first curl dropped out oh my god <laughs> it was glorious <laughs> oh. Oh yeah, so he's good. very giddy, very believable in this. Like he was acting right. like if you woke up and found that you had this massive head of hair, you'd be very because happy. Stacy Keach is a man who's had thinning hair for a while, and I think he really got into it. He's like, yes. Maybe. What I what I thought was what I thought was really funny was when I was looking stuff up about this anthology. One of the few like pieces of trivia that I found was just that he did that whole take of unwrapping his head with the single hair falling down. That was one single take. And they they took it just the one he did it on the first try. I was like, that's that's so important that that's like one of the few facts they have about this. Just that one little curl <laughs> falling out, one take. <laughs> the effects work is done by uh, by K and B, who obviously we've talked about on the show before. Um, it makes sense with Nicotero showing up in the movie. Um, he's. Um, but then he discovers there's a downside to this. He has paid a, a price to having this luxurious head of hair. What What's going on? What's happening? What's uh, the first, wrap up of this story? Yeah. At, at first, he just realizes that his hair doesn't really stop growing. He wakes up the next day and it's grown like another foot and it's just getting crazy long. But then it goes even further that it's starting to like sprout from his face and it's like coming up through his throat and it's like invading his entire body. And he's got yeah. like these sores and it's like taking over. He's yeah, looking a little Sasquatchy at this point. Yes. A little bit. And we got a little foreshadowing, I mean, you know, uh, earlier. I think when he gets his haircut at the stylist is the first time we see little thin shadows moving on the mm-hmm. ground. And we're like, ooh, is the hair alive? As it inches away toward mm-hmm. the drain or some shit. 
<laughs> and then confirmed <laughs> confirmed that it is alive when he cuts the one coming out of his mouth and we <laughs> the tiniest little <laughs> scream. <laughs> <laughs> and it tries to bite his finger under the microscope. Does. Yeah. When that hair came out and it screamed, I <laughs> lost it. I was I like, love <laughs> tiny screams. Because there's there's a there's a Simpsons Treehouse of Horror where Homer gets like a hair transplant from Snake and then he starts goes on like a murder spree because like the, it's like a bad hair transplant and I thought for sure that's where this is going is that like it was gonna make him crazy and into a murder. Did not expect hair snakes that scream. <laughs> yeah, it was an amazing stories episode I remember called Hell to Pay, which is about a toupee that like had a life of its own attached to your head and started you know what was the Treehouse of Horror episode called? Do you remember? That's what it was called. Hell to pay. pay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, it turns out that uh, he's been implanted by. So the the ending of this is just like off the fucking wall. Right. Uh, it turns out that David Warner and Debbie Harry are actually much like Frankenfurter and Columbia. And, uh, they're aliens from space who have they like eating human brains. And they figured the way that they can uh, attack humans is by using their vanity will the humans will allow them to implant these alien things in them uh which eat their brains and make them into subservient creatures that then they harvest and put into it's like what but okay it's 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 funny this is the republican thinking process today this is (laughs) (laughs) they put little zing all right what yeah Um, oh, it's, what's so crazy is that they throw that information at you really fast and like that's it you're done mm-hmm. yeah that is I the said, 50s is sci-fi movie zinger it's like we're aliens and we come to earth and we're colonizing the earth and by putting we started out as little tiny things and now we've grown into david warner and debbie harry and we're taking over the world um okay <laughs> silliness for John Carpenter's second episode <laughs> and his third episode, which uh, the way I read it, he wasn't able to direct. The th- he was supposed to direct all three of these, but for some reason he couldn't because of the schedule. And so Toby Hooper uh, simultaneously, I think as John Carpenter were doing the other two. He did the third one. What's the third yeah. one called and who's in it? I, it is called I and it stars uh, Mark Hamill. It was also in Village of the Damned. Yeah, that's where we know him from. <laughs> it's, like, it's like some sort of space armor. And the Giver. Still, still my favorite. Well, Hammer Village Hammer. of the Damned is other John Carpenter connection, even though yeah. I guess this is Toby Hooper, but okay. Yeah. Oh, we also uh, have, uh, we have Twiggy is in this. 66, 1966's Woman of the Year. Twiggy. <laughs> supermodel. Singer? I think so. She, yeah, no, she wasn't a singer. She was a model. She was like Andy Warhol's muse. Okay. Mm-hmm. There we got Twiggy. Yeah. We also have uh, Roger Corman. Yeah, uh, we have as a, a guest appearance by Roger Corman. Yeah. And I can't remember if anybody else uh, made it. Oh, Toby Hooper shows up, but that's in the morgue sequence later on. Yeah, that's that's our final, our, our final little okay. snippet. So what's I about? I is about a baseball player, Colin, a very successful baseball player. No, not a very successful baseball player. He's like a minor league baseball player. Very old baseball player. He's a a minor league baseball player. He's got big dreams of making it big, even though he's like 45. He's about to get drafted. He's about to get drafted to like the Dodgers or something. The Giants. The Giants. Yeah. It's going going to the Giants. Yeah. It's It's his last shot. (laughs) <laughs> it's me he's been waiting for it all his life it's come close before so this is his last shot and so on he had his a really way, good game yeah and on his way home as his wife has like uh set up you know like uh the the she's surprise a, yeah she's about him. to surprise him let him know he's gonna be a daddy he reaches for his favorite cassette which is on the floor of his car. So this is a, because back in the day, of cassettes, this is how most car accidents happened in the nineties. I, I don't think know if you guys so. Know this. The stats on this are through the roof. Well, yeah, because <laughs> my dad had this cassette case. Well, when they Everyone made, when they had, when they eventually created CD players in cars, then you had the CD uh, like sleeve visor. Yeah, that you could put on the visor, so you didn't actually yeah. have to take your eyes off the road. Really, you could just kind of look up, pull a CD out, put it in. But the tape mm-hmm. deck. 
you had to have like you know your little briefcase with all your tapes in it that you keep mm-hmm. on the floorboard of the passenger seat. Yeah, you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's where it always was. And of course, then a deer like stands in the middle of the road and he has to swerve, and bam, he hits the tree. Kaplam. Shard of glass in the eye. That's right, which is bad if you're a baseball player. Okay, so I'm going <laughs> to just that's if you're a, a baseball player. That's the eye he uses to see the ball. Just that one. Yeah, he says when he wakes <laughs> up. Like in the- it's the eye he used to see the goddamn ball. <laughs> <laughs> I like that there's no mention of like, yeah, you can't play baseball because you'd lose your depth perception. There's no talk of that. It's no. the one eye he looks at the ball with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give it to me straight, Doc. I got a concussion. No, it's worse than that. Well, I'm they afraid. do always say keep your eye on the ball. They say just singular, so I guess that's what they mean, right? I don't know sports. <laughs> I think that's a technical <laughs> term, and I think you're correct. <laughs> Both Mark Hamill want, and Twiggy. All right, all right, hold on, hold on. I want you three to tell me exactly what you know about sports right now. Based on baseball, you hit the ball. I, the ball. No, I, know. I know a lot about football. You so run the bases. <laughs> Yeah, you run the bases, Colin. You mostly. I just want to know. You hit the ball with a bat. The bat's made of wood. What if, are the it, if it has cork inside it? That's bad. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you some trivia right now that I was unaware of that may blow your minds. According to MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Free Show Wall of Fame, we have made an induction. Well, we made two. I'll tell you the other one later. But we made the induction of a guy named Robert Louis Bush. Robert Louis Bush is the guy who um, discovers him and his wife discover uh, oh, Mark Hamill's been accident. in the car accident. And I'm like, who the fuck is Robert Louis Bush? But Robert Louis Bush has been in three John Carpenter movies that we've done. He was also in In the Mouth of Madness. He was Hotel Man. And he was in Village of the Damned as Mr. Roberts. So it's possible that Robert Louis Bush is another john carpenter player who is unrecognized by horror film society except for the saturday night freak show thanks to mf mad we are pointing that out we're breaking news tonight lewis bush that's right he's doing doing some good work that mf mad yeah peter jason george buckflower robert bush boom all right there you go amazing okay so he lost the eye mark hamill and so this is very depressing to him so John Agar is a we doctor. Love a depressed, depressed Mark Hamill. That's right. We don't mm-hmm. like depressed Mark Hamill. We want to cheer him up. So the doctor <laughs> has uh he's like the, the first and only eye transplant doctor in the universe. And so yep. they give him an eye transplant, and by golly, it works. He can see out of that new eye. And it's a fantastic it's new day. It is brown. That's that's important. It's like black like the devil. It's, it's, it is. It's it is. Well, originally it has like it bleeds uh, sometimes. Yeah, bloody outside on it. It's like a fucking stuff. Bond villain. Sometimes. Yeah. So he uh, begins to. Um, he sees things. He experiences his flashes of naked women rising up out of the dirt in his backyard project as he's landscaping the backyard. Bloody hand out of the garbage disposal. Uh, other phantasmagorical things like this. Mm-hmm. This begins to feel very similar. Like we've seen this kind of thing before, maybe in the movie Body Parts with uh, Jeff Fahey, or later in a movie called The Eye, the current South Korean movie, I believe it was remade with Jessica Alba. Um, so yeah, basically the whole idea of all of those stories is if you be 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 afraid of experimental medical technology because if they give you a transplant of somebody else's body part you are going to experience some of your personality is going to be a co-opted by the other personality and wouldn't it be horrible if they put a serial killer's eye in your head how's that going to fuck you up <laughs> i mean yes <laughs> oh and it Can results living with that oh and it results in one of my favorite things that's very underrated, which is Crazy Mark Hamill. Love it we, with all my heart. I think we need Crazy Mark Hamill because regular Mark Hamill is bad. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and when you get Crazy Mark Hamill, you get, you get things like that. <laughs> that's right. And truly, he can go off the rails very well. Yes, he can. That's why he's such a good joker. Mm. Very true. Yeah. 
he goes off the rails in a oh, so Toby Hooper directs this episode. I thought it was uh unkind to Mark Hamill. Again, Mark Hamill asks, there's a, a fucking sex scene between him and um uh Twiggy where the camera angle is in like a very odd position for you, you know, like as a director. You know, it's like I would you want to protect your actors yeah. a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not done too well in this uh-uh. scene. Yeah. If it's... I were to just take this scene and interpret how like it Toby Hooper feels about them, I would say he hates them based on how he shoots this scene. Yeah, that's legit. See, I, I the way I took it, and you could be absolutely right, because it's like, well, this could be exploitive, okay, is one way. But I'm almost like Toby Hooper just had no fucking clue. And he's like, well, this is where you put the camera. I don't know. I, I'm not a big fan of Toby Hooper. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre and like Poltergeist. And I mean, he said, you know, Fun House is, but, and Salem's Lot. <laughs> <laughs> not a big fan. Not a okay. Fan. Not a, you know, but after that, it's like Toby Hooper, uh, you know, in the Mangler era or whatever, the mortuary and, you know, eventually, you know, he said he ended up in uh, in Abu Dhabi, you know, exiled from America doing a movie called Jin over there. It's like it's, uh, Toby Hoover's like not a, a terribly. I don't want to say competent. Obviously, he can make a movie, but it doesn't like he cares too much about it. You know, his episodes of Masters of Horror were generally the worst ones. The Dance of the Dead and uh, whatever the fuck that awful thing was with the how you didn't the even see it. Toolbox Murders. Is that one? Of yeah, I did kind of like Toolbox Murders, the remake. Just, yeah, yeah. Add another like, one to the list. It's just like he's he's not a very thoughtful director. You know, mm. like yeah. it's very every it's everything's very straightforward and not and not in a good way, not like a polished way. It really. The more I watch of his and the more the time goes on, I'm like, Texas Chainsaw was a real fluke, wasn't it? And yeah. Life Force, damn it. The greatest sci-fi uh, naked Force, vampire. I'll give you that one. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> that's true. That's Yeah, that's like his second best movie. And Poltergeist, but that was... Uh, it but seems I mean, like still really arguing good. over that. Yeah, we'll they're still know. arguing over Poltergeist. It's <laughs> um, so good. So... There's a lot of religious, uh, there's a religious subtext to this movie, which really yes, stands out. there's a lot out. of frantically reading of Bibles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Twiggy has a uh, crucifix that she wears all the time. There's a scene where they're having sex in bed or making love, sorry, husband and wife, making love in bed. That's and not love. He's possessed by this serial killer that he doesn't know yet, and her hand flops over on the Bible, like she's touching the Bible in one hand. As he's going down on her, very strange. Um, the uh, yes, there's a lot of uh, he he his character resorts to reading well, apparently random passages from the Bible in order to try and ward off the evil that's overtaking him. I don't know how successful this is because it's like it just yeah. feels like and it well because it, it makes me it makes me wonder if this whole story was written based on the bible verse or if they tried to tie the bible verse into the story and i feel like it was written around the bible verse yeah but because it, it ends which, with that what's the bible yeah, verse you're speaking it's, of um matthew 18 9 i think it's in the new testament um and it, yeah it, it's it's the one everyone knows that it's basically you know saying you know if if uh your eye if your eyes sin uh to pluck it out um yeah, what is specifically it? your right yeah. eye. If your right eye offends yeah. you, pluck it out yeah, and it, cast it, it, it aside or something. Li- yeah, it's better to go through life with one eye than two, so it's better to pluck it out. It's something like that. Yeah, because that's, I read it. that's where our movie is going to end <laughs> up, that basically like there's a split personality thing going on here. He's being overtaken by the, uh, ki- the, the, the serial killer who was apparently abused by his mom. We see this in flashbacks at some point. Mark Hamill creates a um, crib. He's building a crib for his newborn and crawls into it and has like a screaming fit. In the, and we're like, this is the baby. Say the baby, Sean. Baby. Say it. What? <laughs> Mark Hamill doesn't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a point of view shot like he has. Rocking back and forth in that it, crib. Right. But I was more disturbed by him doing that than the entirety of the baby. Yeah. What? Are you insane? <laughs> don't don't so 
soil Mark I, I, Hamill with that I'm baby sorry. shit. No, no, I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm disturbed by Mark Hamill. I don't think he's a good actor. And when he is acting, it's just like, oh, I don't want to watch this man. I think he does well sometimes like this. But like I do baby. not enjoy watching that man's face. Ugh. The baby is easily the sleaziest movie we've ever watched on yes. this show. Oh, Bar man. Yeah. Like, you weren't that's here for quite Ilsa, a- She-Wolf of the SS. That's fucked up. It might have hit a granite layer bottom on that one. But, yeah. Uh, it's uh, in the end, he ends up plucking the eye out or stabbing. And you think he survived yeah, that or he, did he die? No, no he, he died. died. He stabs himself in the eye with garden shears and he kills himself because it goes he, really far in that that hits the brain. Yeah, he's dead. I, yeah. I have a question. Um, I didn't have subtitles on, so for that pat for that like last minute, I didn't hear a word his wife said. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what did, what was she saying to him. She, I couldn't really understand her either, but I, I gathered that she was telling him like how like to that do Bible, it. No, the Bible was his. She was reminding him that that Bible was his. Um, she was saying like um, and that I think she was telling him the story of where she, of where he got it. I think she gave it to him. Yeah, because well, she kept saying like he kept saying the name of the killer, which was like Robert Lawson. Robert Lawson. She's like, it's in the Bible. He's like, Robert Lawson's not in the Bible. And she's like, no, it's in the Bible. That, that's the part I didn't get, which I think is crucial. Yeah, I think. And then he, he looks, and the Bible's been inscribed, and it's like it. I mi- yeah, I missed that also, Sean. But I, I also, yeah. but I think, but I think that's they fucked up. I, this is Toby Hooper. He didn't make that clear at the end, I don't think. Yeah, carelessness. Sure. Like we were saying, carelessness, you know? Yeah, well, yeah he doesn't like, he's like, all right, I got to make sure this gets across. He's just like, eh, they should get it. That kind of thing. Yeah, because she kept saying John Russell in the Bible, John Russell. Well, no one in the Bible has a last name, so that's just not accurate. Yeah. Right. Did someone, did the killer give him the Bible? I have no idea. I didn't quite get what was going on there. Uh, and then he, he stabs himself in the eye. The table by her hair. Okay, yes, he let's talk about that because you that's not you can't do that. No. <laughs> hair, hair does not tie like that. It no. would fall out. As soon yeah. as he like wrapped it, it falls out. Yeah. I I was like, did I see that right? I thought for sure I misread that situation or no, nope. you got you got it right. Thanks, Toby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he dies, and that's the end of that uh, episode. All the uh, the stories are connected by when John Carpenter, as the um, mortuary attendant uh, or the coroner or whatever he's supposed to be, is going around unzipping the body bags and is like, look what happened to this guy. He was found, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, um, although we hear yeah. that the Stacey Keach character apparently jumped out of a window and then got hit by a train. Uh, and became like a little puddle and uh, that doesn't actually happen in the story but that was the the wraparound and then right. in the the final wraparound we find out you know because tom arnold shows up and toby hooper are uh, you know other morgue attendants who come down john carpenter uh you know crawls into a body bag and apparently he is a cadaver mm-hmm. in the morgue Bravo. i liked it yeah i liked yeah. it too i really liked it yeah good. yeah all right well we're running a little long in this episode. You can basically play it as a commentary track, probably for the movie itself. <laughs> probably. But it's we're like going to go around the table that. and we're going to tell you what we thought of it and if we would recommend it to you uh, to do that. All you got to do is stick with us. First of all, we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman. His name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. He thinks you go. He's he's got a little hairy. He no, he has he has a body (laughs) bag. We all went for three jokes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, he has a a body bag. We just tell him it's a sleeping bag. That's a good one. I like it. That's, that's all right. That's good. Uh, okay. We're going with that one. <laughs> well, now we're not. Now we're not. <laughs> okay, well, what was yours? No, I said, I said, does Igor have a body bag? So oh, we're, okay. we're on the same page. See, I was going hair like he had a new hair. <laughs> <laughs> Igor with a toupee. We should maybe these jokes before. Nah, it's fine. <laughs> well, usually there's like five seconds of all staring at each other, waiting for someone to go. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then we just all jump in. I like how Colin... This expects us to make. I know. I get to set it up. That's uh, that's my my role is just to set it up. You have to. 
That right? seems pretty easy, Colin. That, that was a va- baseball metaphor, I think, right there, Sean, that I was working on. Oh, um, <clears throat> that's right. You need to hit a home run. So there you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, let me tell you this, listener. In order to join this fun section of our uh, show, you can write into us, and we'll read your stuff on the air. All you got to do is follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Freak Show. Or Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And you can follow along on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Well, MF Mad, the keeper of the Wall of Fame. Again, if a, if an actor, director, or whatever is uh, in a movie that we have covered three times, we've covered movie there in three times, we'll like give them a little plaque and put them on a wall. We send them all uh, you know, certificates. Don't worry, they're in the mail. If you're listening right now, they're they're in the mail. If you haven't got them yet, <laughs> they're, yeah, um, but, they're constantly in the mail. So we are inducting into the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame Stacy Keach because we have done body bags. Uh, we have also done uh, Batman Mask of the Phantasm, and we did Escape from L.A. What'd you think of his Yay. hair and Escape from L.A.? He's got a ponytail, doesn't he? Yes, he wears That's a cap, so we don't know if he's going bald, but he does have a ponytail. And stay tuned for Gotti, where he's essential. Yeah. <laughs> he has Coming to tell Colin. John Travolta who all the five boroughs are. Can we do, wait, can we do that as a, a watch along for Christmas? And just not tell anybody? <laughs> so do a watch along, and then on Christmas Day, they open up, they're like, fucking Gotti? <laughs> <laughs> well, Coming. about tonight's movie, Body Bags, Crypticus writes in and says, Body Bags is a great underrated anthology flick due to all the cigarettes john carpenter actually looks like the coroner now upon last viewing i had a panic attack during mark hamill's fulci-esque eyeball damage scene but that was due to something i smoked (laughs) that'll happen yeah Uh, amos martinez says it's not top tier carpenter or hooper but it's still fun mostly for the endless supply of genre people who show up for a 90s movie from these directors it's pretty all right yeah considering it's a 90s movie like that's yeah. a big thing there and that right, they sure. they did this pretty good Teresa ann says i remember loving this as a kid it used to air all the time on sci-fi i like the way that she uh specifies it's sci-fi s-c-i-f-i not s-y F Y mm-hmm. not Siffy. No, yeah. yeah. Uh, and she <laughs> says, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, Nick Siebel says it's a horror anthology starring John Carpenter as the crypt keeper sold. I've seen this movie more than a few times. It's not great, but it's a fun watch. I wish the killer in the first story was more menacing or wore a mask. Seriously. Lewis from revenge of the nerds is a weak ass <laughs> slasher. And if that's the case, they also should have had booger, AKA Curtis Armstrong in it too. There you go. I'm just going to say no to Curtis Armstrong in, like, anything. Has he ever just been a slasher? Curtis Armstrong? Think, you'd think he would. I like he's, him in Moonlighting. Uh, in what? Moonlighting. Oh, I, um, I like him in uh, Better Off Dead. But he was uh, he was kind of a bad guy in Supernatural. Okay. Well, there you yeah. go. If you told me he was in the background of The Burning, I'd believe you. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was. Why not Curtis Armstrong? Uh, think, Ed uh, Snyder writes in and says, I'm glad you guys are doing this one. I remember watching this back when it premiered on Showtime. This film certainly brings back memories of my horror filled childhood. I like the story of Carpenter regular Peter Jason's story of how he got the role as the drunk husband who checks on George Buck flower. Carpenter just wanted his car for the film, but Peter was hesitant on giving it to him. So instead he insisted that he give him the part as well. And that's how he got the role of the significant other of Molly Creek, who is Jim's mom from the American pie movies. She was the lady in the car at the gas station. So there you go. That's a nice little connection right there. Yeah. Yeah. How many times do we have Peter Jason on this show? We're actually going to have to consult the wall at this point, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's been all the Carpenter movies and angel. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, angel. He was one of the Johns and Angel. Yeah. Uh, Nelson Nascimento says, oddly enough, Carpenter shines in front of the camera this time around. I love the flick, even though it's a hit and miss at times. I wish Showtime had picked up the series and delivered more episodes. Carson Snar says, is this the one where the stories involve the guy growing sentient strands of hair with sharp teeth? If so, I need to watch this again. Yeah. 
Uh, yep. <laughs> Nuvato Judokas is looking at Alex Datcher alone in this movie is worth it. But Carpenter is surprisingly really good as the host. Alex Dasher was in the first uh, in the gas station. And mm-hmm. Dennis Peck says, my favorite story is the first one. Lots of Carpenterisms and some neat cameos, not to mention a black female lead, which was pretty unique. And she did a fantastic job. Yes. I don't know how unique okay. it was She's in great. 1990. Yeah. Like Peter Gett says, I've seen it, but I can't remember anything about it. Rewatch. <laughs> um <laughs> The last week we watched a movie called Of Unknown Origin. Eric Kirby says, Is it Saturday yet? I want this review now. <laughs> and make sure it's a two hour show. I'm, it's a very underrated 80s movie. That's going to be a divisive episode. I think, <laughs> I think so. I mean, really, it, it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Kevin Clayton says, I used to watch the movie on HBO back in the 80s. I have the DVD and still pop it in whenever I feel like watching a gigantic rat torment. Peter Weller and Michael Whitaker says, if hunting that thing is anything like what I go through when a mouse gets into my home, I understand the obsession to which I say, well, thank you, Michael. There you go. Vindicated. Yeah, Colin feels vindicated. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the week before we watched a movie called from beyond Sean Roger writes in and says, uh, we missed this because we've done so many Stuart Gordon movies at, at this point. We have mentioned it before, but he brings up the Stuart Gordon along with Brian Usna also wrote honey. I shrunk the kids and yeah. Stuart Gordon was attached to direct it too, but he had to drop out due to health reasons at the time. Uh, Pat Hetfield a lot of sense, actually. answered a question that we <laughs> asked on that show. What the hell was Ken Foray cooking uh, on oh, the yeah. stove? And yeah. Uh, yeah, Pat Hetfield really says he, when he was cooking, it looked like dumplings in the pot. And this is completely based on how it appears. I have no other proof. Don't worry, Pat. I Googled it. And uh, Michael Whitaker also agreed with you. It's uh, dumplings and stew. There you go. You can All find right. a recipe. All right. All right. Uh, Owen Johnson. That's right, right. That's, I mean, that's what it looked like. I just have, didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're doing. We're all doing it wrong. We just eat beef stew. We don't put fucking dumplings in. Doing it wrong. Uh, Owen Johnston says. Uh, or Owen Johnson, sorry, says uh, the Oakster here. And all I got to say is, a relative happened to walk into this movie right when Barbara Crampton was doing her thing. The bald Jeffrey Combs, and they were like Homer Simpson backing through that bush in that episode. Sorry, I didn't mean to disturb you <laughs> with whatever you were doing. Isn't it, isn't it funny how whoever you're in a building with has an innate knack to just like walk in at the complete wrong time, no matter what you're watching? Yeah. I feel like my thing. I that would like be a scene. I, right I feel like there. when I was like a teenager, my parents always did that. Yeah. Like yeah. It's, it's, it's on the same wavelength of. Uh, when you shout right when everything goes quiet. Yeah, yeah, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like that same power. Yeah. But parents have a way of doing that. It's like the movie's harmless, except for the, the S&M bondage scene, and that's when they walk in. Except for that. Yeah, I know. Uh, Jacob Law says, I can see the inspiration for the Grant monster in Slither in From Beyond. And Bill mm-hmm. Hainer said that uh, the proboscis head. coming out of Jeffrey Combs' head uh, gives new meaning to the phrase head banging. Oh, because we said it looked like yeah, he was whenever he was aroused, the thing would come out. Okay, so thank you all very much. You cannot write in <laughs> for writing. <laughs> thank you to everyone else who thank wrote you. in. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you, everyone else. <laughs> yeah, we certainly do appreciate it. In all seriousness, um, so now we're going to go around the table, and we're going to tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, which was called John Carpenter's Body Bags. That's right, get it right, John Carpenter's Body Bags. Starting with John. Well, thank you, Sean. Sean, what did you <laughs> think about tonight's movie, Body Bags? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, what a fun movie! I had. A lot of fun. It's not a great movie, but they don't. You know, movies don't always have to be great. But I had a lot of fun watching this movie. Um, the, I mean, the first story I thought was you know uh, a real good suspense one. I, I enjoyed that one very much. Second one was fucking hilarious. Um, I love Stacy Keach, so to see him with a, a just a long mane of hair and to be that <laughs> giddy about it, I think his performance is great in this movie. Just what it needed to be. Um, the ending's like you said. It's a little like whoa out of nowhere. Um, so it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a little like, 
I'm not going to say a letdown. I mean, how can you be let down by, you know, tiny screaming aliens eating your brain? Um, so I like that one. Third one is, uh, I mean, aside from Mark Hamill, who, again, I do not enjoy watching as an actor, but <laughs> we got some crazy stuff from him in this movie. So, I mean, even that was good. Um, but yeah, it's just a fun movie. John Carpenter's great. Like, I love watching him do this on screen. He had fun, which made me enjoy it. Um, yeah, this is a fun movie. I'll watch this again. I had a great time. So, yeah, I recommend John Carpenter's Body Bags. Um, wait, there's only, who can I go to? Uh, Michaela, what'd you think about Body Bags? I agree with a lot of what you said, Sean. This was my first time watching, and I, uh, I mean, I'm always down for a horror anthology, and usually there's going to be, you know, weak spots and slowdowns, but I really liked all of these, and I liked them all for different reasons. Um, and I, I really liked just like the vibe of the whole thing. I loved the style of like the, the morgue and like how nineties it looked. And I yeah. thought Carpenter was great and I didn't expect that. And I'm kind of sad this didn't become like a TV series. Cause I would have watched the shit out of that. Mm-hmm. And I'm really sad. I didn't see this as a kid. Cause I think I would have loved it. And yeah. I think it's like, it would be pretty great for kids to watch. I think. And it's, Man, I just, it went so many directions I did not expect. Like, I I thought I had the hair one down. I was like, it's going to be like a wig that makes him evil, right? Or like haunted yeah. hair plug, you know? See, I thought, I thought it was going to be like, he was going to wake up in the morning and he would just be living in hair. Like, like, like it would just be Barrel everywhere. Like, yeah, I, I thought it was just going to be it. everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where it looked like it was going for a while, too. And no, I could not have predicted <laughs> screaming hair snakes that feast on your brain just no way so i love the absurdity of it i love the goofiness of it i love the performances it was a lot of fun and i really this is something i wish we could have watched together because i know we were all cackling individually when the hair snake stuff happened and it would have been good and like the mark hamill of it all as goofy as it is it is also very disturbing like man some of the ways he like contorts his face and stuff is just real upsetting um, I find that story particularly interesting, too, because I know a couple years ago, John Carpenter had a health scare where he thought he was going to lose his vision. And Ooh. he was like so distraught and depressed because he's like, my whole career is based around being able to see if I if I lose my vision, I lose everything. So, like, it's really interesting that that's the one story he didn't direct in this, like one that ended up being like really personal to him later on. Mm-hmm. And I I relate to that too because if i lost my eyesight i would definitely not have the same career i have now if any so that's a really terrifying thing to think about so like, i also i also wondered if uh, mark hamill was triggered be filming a, a car accident scene right yeah right. You're kidding. i didn't even think about that but that's a good point yeah but definitely recommend body bags it's awesome like sean i agree with you said it's not it's not the greatest but it doesn't have to be because it's got enough other great things working for it so i definitely recommend it colin what did you think well i guess you know you go with an anthology movie you kind of have to rate the segments um the first one is the most carpenter-esque and it is basically what i expected from a movie called john carpenter's body bags it was a pretty concise little short you know, suspense thriller. I thought it was well executed. Uh, I like the cameos, which, you know, we said with Wishmaster, that's what we're doing at this point in time. All the horror people are getting together in the last hurrah of their generations. Uh, you know, and then, you know, obviously hatchet and those guys have kept it going well past its expiration date. But, um, so I liked the first one, even though I was aware that it was like, Okay, this is just John Carpenter doing shit that he's already done before. So it's like there's nothing really new or exceptional here. It's just like this is John Carpenter doing a TV episode. And it's like, okay, that's pretty good. And then the second one with the hair was like this silly, goofy comedy thing. You're right. I think uh, Stacey Keach is good. Um, but I just was like, this is a fuck off, you know, story. Where they're just like, eh, we're just doing this and whatever the fuck. Uh, and then in the end, instead I was of, like, this is just instead of a stupid joint. It should just be called a fuck off story. Yeah. On. Yeah. They're just <laughs> fucking off. You know, it's like, yeah, we got money and we're going to do this. And we're going to have fun. I think Stacy Keach is inspired casting. And I, you know, again, now I'm like, well, that guy was actually, you know, doing something a little more serious, maybe with, uh, 
with the part. Then I thought, you know, when I saw this in, in 1993, I was in a different, you know, headspace then watching it now. It's like, okay, I can see what he's doing. He was taking it serious. You know, um, the ending cheapens the whole thing. We're aliens for another planet. We're planting, you know, alien things in your head. It's like, this isn't 1950. What the hell? But okay. And then the third one, the Toby Hooper one, like I said, I've been disappointed by most uh, Toby Hooper movies other than the, the, you know, like the six, I said were great. Uh, you know, like everything else that guy does sucks. And uh, I think this sucked. And uh, was it better than his? Uh, oh, and that's the thing. It's like, well, you know, uh, I thought uh, John, Car- the worst thing that John Carpenter has ever done was probably uh, pro-life, which was like a story that seemed like they needed a second draft on her. That was an episode of Masters of Horror. That was pretty bad. A cigarette burns is like got a good idea, but it's not well realized. Um, this is this whole enterprise is like lesser tier stuff from these guys. And yes, John Carpenter's having fun as the morgue attendant, but it's like it is basically. I feel like the Showtime executives. You watch it and you go like, "All right, well, they did it better in Tales from the Crypt, and ours isn't going to be that good." And it's basically a forgettable thing. So I guess I'm not going to recommend body bags. I, uh, I didn't like the third one. I was indifferent or didn't like the second one. And the first one was like, eh, it was okay. And so that's a bad batting average for anthology. So I'm going to say Oof. you can pass. Yeah, you can pass on John Carpenter's stuff. Like I said, it ends and we're being generous to go to in the mouth of madness, you know, because uh, memoirs of an invisible man, but came before that. Um, I know you hate that movie. I, I like it. <laughs> I don't hate it. I don't hate it. Uh, like I said, I, I, I just, you know, it's like, that's not what, I don't know. I just, I, yeah. Complicated, uh, reaction. It would take another money. hour for Colin to yeah. delve into that. I think. So I'm going to, I'm going to pass on body bags. Holly, uh, oh. bring us home with your glowing recommendation of, of body bags. Well, um, I love body bags. I think it's hilarious. I think it gives me everything that I, that I could want from an anthology show, uh, pilot that was put out by Showtime. That's supposed to kind of mimic tales from the crypt because I think it gives everything that I would expect from a show like that. You know, we get the We get like an actual like serious thriller serial killer story. We get a weird, goofy, funny alien story. And we get a crazed psycho sci-fi kind of story. So to me, those are like the components that we get from something like that. We get weird and crazy and funny and and sometimes serious. Like that's kind of what Tales from the Crypt and, and shows like that we're about you know so to me it gives me everything i wanted it's got it's got gore it's got humor it's got and and, you know we we talked about how it's like got this like um it's got all these great cameos and actually that was what i thought of when we watched wishmaster and we all enjoyed all those cameos so much i was thinking about my next pick and i was like what have we watched lately that we really enjoyed and i was like well we really liked all of like the horror cameos that from wishmaster we really liked the goofy batshit craziness of night killer and i was like what can we watch that has things like that and i was like body bags that is what body bags is it's batshit crazy it's funny it's goofy, it's silly, but it's also a lot of fun, and it's definitely got horror elements. And I don't know, I've, I've seen this a lot. I, um, I don't remember which one of our listeners wrote in so that she used to watch it on TV a lot, but that's where I saw it. I watched it on like the Sci-Fi Channel, and I remember watching it for the first time because I saw that Mark Hamill was in it. And I was like, oh, yeah, Luke Skywalker, and I was all excited. And then I was like, holy shit, this is not Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker's <laughs> ass! <laughs> like, what the hell? But that's what made me watch it for the first time. And I actually have always liked it. I've always thought it was crazy fun. Um, so, yeah, I I think that's exactly what it is. It's, it's not a good movie. It's a fun movie. It's entertainment, you know. It's That's what you got to take from it. You got It's just a good time. So, yeah, I definitely recommend Body Bags. I think it's a lot of fun. Don't take it seriously. You'll have a good time. 
All right, I got one 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 final question on this. Uh, are do do you think that the segments are in the correct order? Yes. Yes. Waiting for sure. Yes. Yeah, because you have to like the first one is a totally different tone. It's serious, and then it's goofy, which lightens the mood a little bit, and then it's even more goofy. In like a crazy kind of way. You've got serious, funny, insane. Should an anthology it just, it just end with its best story? It doesn't have to. You're saying it should start, so front load it, go big off the bat, and then come down, down, down from there. You're saying but they, see, they didn't know, come down. But the thing is, I'm still entertained by the other two, so it works for me. Okay. Right. Well, what, wait, which? In the middle. What's that? Your best one should be in the middle, I think. As a centerpiece. Which one's the best one? I mean, first one. the first one's the, the quote unquote best, like the best craft. All, ra- best like all around best? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's it's like when you make a mixtape, it's it's about the mood, you know? It's but, about the right. flow of the music. And I feel like this sets up the mood right. I see I see what you're saying, Colin, because if you, you can have like a great beginning of this movie and even a pretty good middle, but if you fuck it up at the end or if you don't, like uh, you didn't like them, and you you said you hated the Mark Hamill one. If you fuck it up at the end, that can leave a bad taste in your mouth. For the I whole think that's thing. why. Yeah, I think Creepshow ends on a really weak note. So I mean, I think, I think your show. ending is very important. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, next but, but week we enjoyed them, Colin. So we're happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So this is uh, an odd one. So it's three, four, and one against. Unfortunately, not Freak Show approved. Um, what's John Carpenter's worst movie? I haven't seen them all. Yeah, I, I haven't <laughs> seen it. There's a lot I haven't seen, so I don't know. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Escape from New York. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, mean, I really did not like Village of the Damned. That was terrible. I mean, yeah, that's not... boring. It's really boring. It doesn't feel like Carpenter at all, either. Mm-mm. I mean, as of right now, that probably takes the place. Yeah, Village of the Damned is just like blah. It's like technically yeah, it's okay, boring. but it's just blah. And it's populated by actors like Mark Hamill and Christopher Reeve and Michael Pere and you. Christy Alley, Alley. was like, what the? F-? Carpenter's 90s B team. B team. Yeah. But none of you have seen The Ward. I don't know. Ghost of Mars no. might be my, like, my least favorite John Carpenter movie. I don't know. I don't know. The, the, toward the end there, they all kind of got. Uh, and he's not dead, but he's never going to make another movie. <laughs> you know, they were he's done. He's not dead, but he might as well. Yeah. He's never getting another theatrical release. I mean, once the ward went no to way, video, no. I was like, be, okay, be, it's he's, over. But he's, but he's happy. I mean, he's making music with his kid. He's scoring yeah. movies when he wants to. Yeah. He's fine. I know, because that's the thing, too. He did the music for this, but the music that he does now with his kid and godson is better than the score to this movie, which was like, eh, it is John Carpenter, but it's like, they live John Carpenter. And not I as good it. as yeah. that. I mean, I, oh, I enjoyed... I- they brought different parts of the, like the dinging when you drive up to the gas station. Yeah. They put that in the score. Yeah, he did like some kind of uh, um, suspense stuff there, but even his score for Halloween, the 2018 Halloween, I thought was uh, you know better. But anyway, here and over there. Uh, next week, we're going to be watching a movie that's chosen by McKenna. What are we watching next week? We are going to stay in the year of 1993. What? And we're going to watch Fire in the Sky. Ooh. Ooh. Alien abduction. Nice. About the Shit. Travis Walton abduction. Yeah, I've never Ooh. seen it, so we'll see. I'm I've always I didn't wanted to it. see it. I've never seen it. Okay, I'm surprised that this movie's available somewhere. Is it even out on video? I'm not it's even... On, are we it's on look, Prime look? for free right now. Okay. Now that I said that, it's going to come <laughs> off. <laughs> right, it's gone. It, yeah, all right. <laughs> okay, Fire in the Sky. Next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show... And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>